Well, hi everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar with Richard Newland. So thanks very much indeed for joining us. You'll see that we've moved into, a, well, I've moved into a new location today. The reason for starting a bit late was my flight was, uh, was delayed, um, but uh, really pleased to be here. We've already got 60 people that have joined us for this webinar and it's going to be absolutely fascinating talking to Richard Newland. And I think hopefully Richard can, uh, can, can, can hear me. I can hear you. I can hear you. Great. Well, that's a very good start. <laughs> you okay? Good. good. Well, we've got Richard on board. At the moment, we've got uh, 75 people have joined us so far, which is absolutely fantastic. So great to have so many people. Uh, as usual, you will notice, those of you that have been following the webinars this week, that I'm at a different location today. So I've been travelling around, visiting different places, and you'll have to have a guess at where I am today. Um, just also a reminder that at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box. So if you, uh, if you press that Q&A, you'll be able to ask any questions you like, and I'll pass those on to Richard. So press the Q&A at the bottom, type in your questions, and I'll pass those on to Richard sort of later on during our webinar. So normally we spend about half an hour with each of our guests. Today we might just go a little bit longer because I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating and uh, lots to talk about with Richard. So if need be, we might extend it a little bit past half an hour, and I'm very grateful to Richard for agreeing to that. So it's just gone uh, two o'clock, but still getting lots and lots of people joining us. We're now up to, to 80, 81 people that are with us, which is absolutely fantastic. So lots of people involved in lots of horses getting involved this afternoon. So Richard, I think we, we might as well get going. It's gone to, I know we've got lots and lots to, to get through. So if I can just start off just by asking, you know, how, how things are with you and, and how things are at, at the yard. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great initiative, this. Uh, congratulations, Dan. I'm, I can see how well appreciated it's been, and uh, it's lovely to have the opportunity to uh, at least talk about horses. Um, so I think, uh, as far as we're concerned, um, personally, everything absolutely fine in my family. Um, uh, very sorry to hear about one or two families where that's not the case, but um, we're actually self-isolating in Norfolk. I'm with, I've, got, I've had... Uh, we have a holiday home here and um, we, we, it's a good place to be isolated. It's, the weather's beautiful, I'm looking out, sun's shining, lovely place to go for walks and so on. And we've got the added benefit, my wife and I, we've got uh, two of my three daughters are with us and so working from home and, and one of my oldest daughter's boyfriend as well. And actually, um, perhaps when this is all over, we'll look back on it, we're very lucky they're in mid to late twenties. It's been rather a special time having them. Having said all that, we would like a little bit of life at the end of the tunnel I'm sure we all would like to know when we're going to come out of this um, now on the racing side um, the big change was when we heard that um, the jump racing was put back to the first of July start and at the time that caused a bit of uh, a couple of weeks ago caused a bit of frustration because we didn't really feel there'd be an awful lot of consultation about it and it's not immediately obvious as to why jump racing should wait and flat racing should start but actually the one thing, of course, it did do is give a bit of clarity. So at least we know what we're aiming for. And I've been um, now got quite involved um, in terms of uh, working with the BHA, trying to make sure we've got a decent programme. And I've had several conversations um, sort of in an inf informal capacity with them, but also at the same token, um, I was asked by the NTF to, to how, because we're one of the biggest summer yards, really. And we obviously do quite a lot of summer racing. So um, I've had quite a few discussions with them. And um, we know that from the 1st of July, we will have a full program. And I would personally be very, very surprised if that doesn't happen. Now, it may be happening behind closed doors, which should be frustrating. I think that will mean some owners can go, but probably in limited numbers. But we don't, we don't have clarity on this yet. But um, from a, as soon as we heard that the deadline was being put back to the uh, racing to start on the 1st of July, or jump racing to start 1st of July, we... Um, Rod, Wayne and myself went through all the horses and we turned out about 15 or 16 horses who effectively were ready to run and we, it's too long to wait till the beginning of July. Um, those horses have had a five or six week break and we're scheduling them all to come in. A D-Day for us is May the 11th, Monday, May the 11th. It might be a D-Day anyway with this lockdown changing a bit, I think. But um, it's, it's the day we've got scheduled to bring these horses back. So now... 
other horses in the yard, a number of them foxtrot horses, were very, in very early training anyway. And we've just carried on because in, 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 in 1st of July, because there's plenty of time to get them nice and ready, but it, they wouldn't have been ready an awful lot before then anyway. So we've been ticking away with about 20 horses. Um, we've cut the staff back. One or two people staff have been furloughed, but everyone, we want everyone back May the 11th. And when we bring all these extra horses in, uh, effectively will be a pretty full team of about 40 horses on the go, 35 to 40. Brilliant. Well, that's a really helpful update, Richard. So thank you very much for, for that. And uh, we've had a few more people join. So we've got 90 people now involved in this, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, just for those who have joined a little bit late, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you press that, you can ask any questions. I'll select some of those. We've already had a huge number of questions. So I'll select some of those to, to ask Richard later on uh, during this, this webinar. But great to have really so many people involved. Absolutely fantastic. So, Richard, you've just spoken about the, the sort of the, the next few months. Let's just go back to last season. I mean, absolutely another fantastic season for the yard and, and particularly must be delighted with the way the move to the, the new stables has gone. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, you know we, we have had a great season. I think we finished 15th in the list. Uh, everyone knows that we don't rate train anywhere near, although we have more horses than we used to, we don't have anywhere near the numbers of horses as with a lot, some of the other yards that we're competing with. We had 60 winners, uh, which is a record for us, so very pleased about that, and we've still got, had a strike rate again above 20%, anyway, 22% or something like that, over the, um, not that I check too often, uh, the, uh, over the, um, uh, you know, over the last seven or eight years, we've managed to maintain that. So that's really good. As far as, and because the big step, as you've highlighted for us, is moving to this new yard, uh, which, you know, we've taken uh, 50, we, you know, we had uh, 14 or 15 months in the building of it, preparing it, planning permissions, having I mean, acquired it, complete new boxes, which hopefully many of you have seen, um, and um, a lovely new gallop, et cetera, et cetera. But um, generally speaking, it's pretty seamless moving over there. Um, what I, one little change is we, we haven't given up our original facility. You know, I still live uh, in the house where I always have lived, at the original yard at Lineker's, and we still have the uphill four furlong gallop, and we still have 25 boxes there. Now, what we have changed a little bit is we've done more of our own pre-training, whereas in the past we'd have been running at sort of 20, 22 horses, and we would have done all the pre-training at other yards. Um, I, I, the main reason we make a change is that well, now we've got the extra capacity, it makes sense to do it. Both, both it's, you want to be in really in charge, if you can, it's nice to be able to do it and then you follow the horse all the way through. But also economically, it makes much more sense. If you, given the amount of money we've invested in the new facility, it, it makes sense not to be just farming it out to other people. So and that's a change. And what we, we whilst actually, uh, you might not be surprised to hear, but whilst this um, enforced lull is going on, um, we've been doing quite a lot of review, reviewing internally. Rod and I have spent quite a lot of time reviewing the performance. If you remember, uh, some of you will know that Rod, my assistant trainer, helps uh, run the training programme and we use a, a thing called Aquinity data. So we've got a fantastic amount of data which we collect on the horses in terms of what speeds they're going, what their heart rates are, what their recovery rates are, and we can get a feel for these horses' fitness. And one of the reasons we started doing a lot of this is because we knew we would like to be moving. And we're, we're comparing the data that we've got um, in the new year with the data, we historic data on the same horses from the season before at Linicus. And um, so what, we, we, what, what I would say is we've, we've had a great season. It did tail off a bit. I mean, that's the honest truth. We had a bit of a cold spot um, at the end of the season, which you know happens to yards. And I think there are a number of reasons for it. I don't particularly think it was just because we were in a different place. Um, but um, we, we, we've had a great season, but I'm very minded to think through all the facilities we've got and try and work out the optimum way to get the best results uh, going forward. And, and what one training routine that might suit one horse might not suit another. We train quite a few more mares now than we used to, fillies and so on. And they probably don't thank you for giving them quite as tough a routine of training as some of the, perhaps the older geldings that can be quite stuffy and need the work. So um, what we're doing at the moment is really trying to work out how do we get the very, very best out of what we do. And I'd say we're still learning. Richard, that's really interesting. And what I'm also quite interested in about 
the detail of the new yard, you pretty much, as I understand it, started with a, a blank canvas in terms of designing and building a, a yard from fresh. Can you just tell us a little bit about the thought process that went into that design and eventually what you decided to include and what the priorities were for, for producing what is a, an outstanding training facility? Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of the actual um, layout of the stables, I put what input I can in, but the creative director, Mrs. Laura Newland, makes the final decision. You'll have to appreciate that. Um, but fortunately, um, you'll have seen people who've been to the yard is that um, neither of us believe in sort of skimping. If you're going to do this, it's an expensive operation. We wanted to build something that we're really proud of, and we are. And, you know, so for example, the boxes themselves, beautiful brick boxes they're oversized they're significantly bigger than most standard stable sizes far bigger than we need to build for regulatory purposes and so on um very airy we've not gone for the american barn so i've never been a big fan of that if i'm honest but uh, you know some people obviously use those facilities but and so we very airy with maximum uh, airflow if you like um we didn't want to we, we've got 43 boxes in the new yard um which is about roughly double of what that we had in the other yard. I think it's the absolute minimum you can have for a facility of that size, given the investment. And, and you know, for example, if, if someone years to come was to rent that facility, they couldn't possibly pay the rent and, and, and train with less than 40 odd horses. Um, not that that's on our mind at the moment at all. Um, the, um, we didn't want to move without being able to train in the same way. So for example, turnout is a very big part, as, as you know, Dan, of our operation. And um, we've got 120 acres at Erlogsey. We've got 40 different paddocks we can turn horses out. So you've got, you know, because obviously you can't use the same paddocks all the year round. You have to rest them. So you've got a winter paddocks and a summer paddocks and so on. It's been pretty challenging this year with the amount of flooding we had, obviously. It's been one hell of a year, hasn't it, with the flooding and now this coronavirus and so on. Incredible, really. But, um, you know, so we've got, we've, got, we've got all the facilities to do everything we always wanted to do. Um, we've... Um, we built a super new menage. There was a menage there already. We actually extended it significantly again. So it's, we use the menage when we're starting all the horses off. It, both actually, in terms of very slow work, it can be effective in terms of doing trotting and gentle cantering, 40 laps, 40 laps. The riders don't like it very much, which makes them work. But um, it, it's good for the horses. And that's got a nice fancy Martin Collins surface on it. Uh, we do, we start all our horses, we've got quite a few we've had now for the summer, who will be going jumping for the first time, come off the flat or, um, and they need to learn to, to, to jump. And um, we start them all there doing pole work. So that, we use that menage facility increasing actually at the moment. Um, we've got a, a six furlong gallop, three quarters of a mile gallop, which is a Martin Collins active track facility, which is, which is, um, I, I, some of you may have heard me say this before, but when we were building this, um, I spoke to a chap called Will Riggle, who runs the Lambourne Estates, and um, he, he, they've got six gallops at Lambourne. And I said to Will, I know him a little bit, I said, well, you know, forget money, one surface, what are you going to choose? And he said, no hesitation, he went Martin Collins Active Track. He said, it's our number one at Lambourne. All the trainers love it. It's very safe, very good facility, low maintenance as well. And, and we're very, very pleased with it. But again, we've been learning how to use it. So... Um, we, we've just, I've just invested literally in the last two weeks in a, a great big new tractor and power harrows so we can harrow it deeper to slow it down. So it, 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 these are subtle changes really. I mean, if you're watching, you wouldn't even notice the difference particularly, but it's all about trying to give, you try, we need to get these horses super, super fit, but we need to do it in the safest possible way so that they, you're always gonna get some injuries at home, but you want as little as possible. So, um, yeah, we've got the six firm on gallop and um, obviously lovely wash down boxes and so on and so forth. I think, you know, um, it, it's, um, we, we don't want for anything. Now we actually left space when we're building it. If I wanted to, I could put in um, a, a round sand, deep sand canter a la Gordon Elliott and Ollie Murphy and one or two others. So um, but personally, I'm not convinced that it's necessary at this stage, but we left space to put it in if we want to. So, but I think we've got two gallops uh, already now. I think we'll, we'll keep continue for the time being working with what we've got. As I say, we're still learning and evaluating all the time. Can I just take you back to the point you're raising about putting the horses out in the, in the field? And obviously that's very important, but a lot of trainers don't do that. Why do you think it is important that horses get to spend time outside? Well, I mean, funny enough, um, 
I think most trainers who can do it, who have the facility to do it, do it. I, I don't think, I mean, and increasingly so, uh, particularly in jump racing, more and more people are doing it. And what you'll find in a number of yards is they have limited turnout. If you're, if you're lucky enough to be proving yourself to be one of the top 10 horses, you get turnout, but the other 90 don't. So um, it's more, I think, about just luck, being lucky enough to have the space to do it. Why do I think it's important, particularly jump horses, because they're often older horses and they've been doing this for quite a long time. They can be quite institutionalized by the time we may be getting them. It, I, you know, in terms of improvement for horses, I do think it's a very big part of it. And, it, it, you know, um, sorry, the risk of a few of you would have heard me say before, but we know that 90% of racehorses carry gastric ulcers. We know that um, gastric ulcers, if you think um, a horse is not designed just to have hard feed and not graze. Horses are designed like cows to ruminate all the time. So just allowing them to graze, I think is, is halfway to sorting that problem out. And that's just one problem, but general well-being of the horse. And also, um, it, it just, it feels like the right thing to do, to treat a horse like a racehorse like a horse and give them a good life. Um, and, you know, some people have worried in the past, oh, well, if you give them too much grass, then they won't eat their hard food. We've never had a problem with it. And the horses get so used to it. And by the time, the, by the, the, first, the first day you turn them out, they might be a bit whizzy around, around the gallop. By the time you do it the third day, they're head down, they're relaxed, they're chilled out. And we put them out in, generally in twos, ones and twos. The odd horse goes on his, if the horse kicks or something, we put, we put them on their own. But, most horses we put them we pair them up they have their mate and they go out with their mate and they like it mm, fascinating well which let's get on and talk about some of the foxtrot horses mm. so um we did speak earlier in the week specifically to a few syndicates and, and those webinars were sort of only for for the people within those syndicates so we won't repeat any of those horses because i think the the owners have already heard about them but let's talk about some of the horses that we didn't speak about earlier in the week so let's start off um with who shot who yeah, who shot who? Um, he's um, obviously a nine-year-old by beneficial. I'm just looking at my notes now. Um, he, um, in a way, I, I mean, who shot who, in a way, uh, has been a super horse, but I've been a bit frustrated by him because I felt we should have won more races with him. Having said that, you look back, and I look back on his record preparing for this, and it, yes, he's only won twice, but he has been in the first three 11 times, 11 additional times. So he's been a remarkably pretty consistent horse, to be honest. Um, we tried a few different things. I've tried sort of putting him on softer ground, running him in the winter. Anyway, I think we all decided after December that we'd give him a break, come back for the summer. There's definitely are more, I'm pretty sure there are more races in him. He's been a bit unlucky though in the spring here because he, he, got, he, got he was actually in the field and this can happen and he, he, he managed to get himself a wound uh, in his hind leg. It turned quite nasty. It was quite difficult to deal with and we had to send him to the vets for a period of time. And since he's come back, we just... He's over that, fortunately, completely over that. And then he had a little niggly problem with his other hind foot, which is something or nothing, not a problem. And actually, he's been on the walker all this week. And funny enough, he's the vets are reassessing him this afternoon with a view to us starting proper training with him next week. And um, my plan would be, so he, he's, he's one that will be probably three months away, really, uh, till we get him ready. But I'd, I would hope he'll be on a track for August, August, end of July, August, September, October or whatever and probably mix and match hurdling and chasing maybe I'm not sure Pro probably chasing I would have thought in the summer would be his best op best opportunity um pretty sure it would actually but he's got higher mark for that he's 129 over fences 122 over hurdles so he has dropped been given a little bit of slack by the handicapper which might just help him a little bit but um hopefully we're back on track now and get him going for the summer autumn great well, if there's any horse that uh, that everyone wants to hear about, and that's Ronnie, a real favourite, I think, with everyone, not just those that are in the syndicate, but I think everyone within Foxtrot and those that follow Foxtrot. So, obviously, went out to America last summer, and can you just give us an update as, as you know, where we are with him? Yeah, I mean, obviously, extremely unlucky in, in America. I mean, it's great that he did pick up some prize money there, uh, but um, I assume you eventually got paid down, by the way, did you? <laughs> did get paid. Took me a lot of form filling, I can tell you. I had to... Um, there's all sorts of tax complications i think it's similar if you go to las vegas and you win big on the casinos they tax you and because suddenly we'd won a lot of money from what was a fairly short trip they were basically the, the i had all these letters saying you need to money prove where this, 
where this money's come from. So I, I was thinking I might get a knock on the door any minute. And uh, but anyway, all, all finalised in the end. A lot of filling out and, and providing evidence as to how we'd won this money. But uh, thankfully, now I know how it all works. So if we do it again, I'll be a lot better equipped for it. Perfect. Well, look, I mean, I, you know, he's one of my absolute heroes too, of course. Not an expensive buy, as we know, and um, won 12 times for us. Still very much the most winning horse I've ever trained. Um, he had two wins before we got there, so he's actually won 14 races in his career. Um, you know, to, for, to, to do what he's done now, what's he done in lifetime? Four, four flat wins, four hurdle wins, and six chase wins. These are horses you die for, I think, really. A brilliant, lovely horse. And um, it, the challenge for him, obviously, is going to be coming back from injury and he's a year older, he's nine years old, so he'll be 10 in this spring. And it, that's probably a bit tougher for him than, let's say, a long distance horse. You know, stamina can increase with age, but you can lose a bit of speed. But you know, we'll see. I, know, I love, I love preparing for this i get a chance to look up and think oh just have a look in them remind myself that he's the you know the, the far and away the highest rated son of arakan that arakan's ever produced as a jump horse um so he's, he's a tremendous horse um he got a tendon strain injury uh in america um it's one of those things you tend you like to give horses 15 to 18 months off really that would be your sort of rule of thumb we did give him um what's called a microcurrent treatment and um, so not just box rest, but I tried the microcurrent treatment where you, you, you put, it, put it on uh, for two hours a day and it gives it electrical impulses. It's something that other people are very keen on. And I, and I tried it on him. And actually, I am touching wood as I say this, but he, he, I just chatting to Rod earlier today, and I was saying, uh, neither of us would be able to tell you which leg was injured if we didn't know. It, that, it, that's how good the leg looks. You, I would defy anyone here to know that he even had a tendon strain. But of course, that doesn't mean that inside there may not still be some damage there. And it is risky. When horses come back from injury, we know that rule of thumb, half of them make it and half of them don't. Uh, and you know, we, we, we just, it's in the lap of the gods. You give them a certain amount of time and then you've got to find out. Now, what we would do is you try and try and be, fairly steady as you do lots of that slow steady work when you're starting with uh when you're starting him off so that we get that we don't put him under too much pressure until we really really have to until he's very close to racing and so he's really fit enough to do himself justice at that point um the slightly awkward thing with ronnie is the timing because we'd all like him on good ground and we know that that seems to be a big factor for him um but but equally, I don't want to rush him too soon. So now wh where I'm at at the moment in my thinking is that we would be looking to start him off in June. So not very far away. Uh, the injury he had was the 25th of July. If we start him in June. I would hope to have him on a track towards the end of September, October time to try and get some racing September, October, November before the ground goes. That, that's 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 where I'm at with my thinking. And by the way, he's in the field and he's an extremely happy horse and he looks a million dollars. So he's in, it, it just been turned out with a lot of other horses and um, he's in great nick. So he's really there for us whenever we want to start. And presumably if we start then, we could give him a break when the grounds become a lot softer over the winter and potentially, and of course, if everything's gone well, look to bring him back again sort of in, in, in the spring once the ground starts improving. Would, would that be right? Absolutely right, Dan. That's exactly how I'd be thinking. Uh, I mean, let's concentrate on getting him back first. That's that's the first challenge and far, probably far away the biggest. If we got, if we're sitting here with a lovely situation, we've got two or three runs in, um, maybe end up in that Ascot race that he won. Um, that was that November, I think. That was the, about about November time. Be a lovely target, wouldn't it, to go back for that race? Um, and then um, if the ground goes at that point, and we can give him a little break, tick away, and come back for March, April for sure. Great. Well, that sounds exciting plans and um, thank you for all your hard work with, with him. Um, just moving on, about, uh, about a year ago, we visited your stable and saw this horse that you said you just bought from point to point for us and uh, it was called Mr Muldoon. Well, a, a year on, it's not been a bad year, Richard. No, it's been a brilliant year, hasn't it? Actually, um, uh, th 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 this will ruin the next year, I'll tell you what, because I get, I get contacted in various these things. I got contacted last week from time form saying they want me to put up horses to follow, you know, three horses. Who was my novice to follow? I went, Mr. Muldoon, novice chaser. 
very excited about him. And particularly as I, I've, like a complete mug, told everyone who was prepared to listen to me, he had no chance of winning his first race at Worcester, and he duly did. Um, so uh, he surprised me then, but he's continued to surprise me. What's lovely about him is that he is uh, lightly raced. You know, he's only had five one runs under rules. He's won three of them, and he's ended up at As winning at Ascot. The form of that race has worked out reasonably well, pretty well, you know, as, as it normally would. You don't, you, don't, you don't get bad races at those sort of tracks. Um, and obviously, I want to go chasing with him because I, I feel sure he's going to be a better chase than the hurdler. He's already rated, what, 132. So um, who's to say where he'll take us? But he's definitely one of the more exciting ones we've got. And, um, I, 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 you know, there's something very likeable about him. I, you know, he, he seems he's straightforward at home. He's improving. Um, yeah, he, and, and he jumps for it really well. So I do think um, we, we could have some fun. But I'm pretty sure we, we best. he's one I think we should just kick on and go chase it. I can't see any point hanging around doing more handicap hurdling. He's had his novice hurdle season. As you say, it's been a great success with three good wins. So he's going to come into training with a view to sort of being ready yeah. to run in, in, sort of in the autumn. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have said. Uh, yeah, uh, even though he's, he would be ready to start now, I don't think we should. I think he's one we're looking to start in July to get him on a track for October, November and have a full winter season. Because that's the other thing with him. He handles soft ground exceptionally well, as he proved to Ascot. Um, so, you know, there's no need to run him on anything quicker. And to be honest, there's not even that many good races for him to go for. Um, no, very exciting, very exciting horse. Well, can we move on to another horse that we've only recently bought, ran once, won once. Uh, it's been terrific. So tell us a little bit more about little Rory Mack. Little Rory Mack. Well, I mean, he's another one that I'd be pretty sure we've not seen the best of yet. I mean, it was frustrating, actually, because he would definitely have run again if we hadn't had the enforced break. Um, but th that was his novice hurdle season. So we nicked that novice hurdle race, which was nice. Uh, and um, But, it, it, you know, from my perspective, I think, we should go chasing with him too. I mean, you could consider, we might consider going for a handicap hurdle first run back because one of the things you'll, people notice with him is he is a bit keen. That's the biggest challenge. Um, he's, he, he, from a training perspective, he's perfectly manageable, but he is a bit keen. So, and, and it's quite interesting. So if you, people who look into the breeding will know, he's, first of all, he's by Yates. Um, I've just bought another Yates recently. Yates is, I think, could still yet prove to be a top, top National Hunt Stallion. You know, sometimes it takes a little while. I think Midnight Legend, he was 18 and 19 by the time he really started showing that he could produce good jump horses. And I could see Yates being a bit similar. He's produced a, quite a lot of good horses now, but no superstars. Um, Yates, of course, himself was a four-time Ascot Gold Cup winner. It's a terrific stamina. And what's really interesting about Little Roy Mack is he's got four half brothers, all rated over 130, who run 22 races between them. So, in a way, he's he's a poor member of the family, even though he's only won a couple of races. So he needs to to join those, um, is you know these um, illustrious brothers of his. But the interesting thing is, all those most of those horses are three mile plus, and one of them's three and a half mile, three mile five furlongs. So if we could get this horse, Little Rory Mack, to settle down a bit, calm down a bit, I feel sure he'll want a longer distance. The combination of Yates and the pedigree on the dam side scream that he wants stamina, which is one of the reasons I was excited about buying him, because I felt that, that I saw what he's achieved over two miles, and you know, we've run him over two miles, he's 121 rated. If we can get him the penny to drop at some point and him just to relax a bit more in his racing, you could see very significant improvement going up in trip. But he is going to have to relax to do that. And one of the things I do like about him is I think he's a very good jumper, and I think he showed it um, in his win at Kelso that he that he can um, he can go from the front if needs be, and that doesn't stop him from jumping well. And I think that um, uh, I'm hopeful that the fences sometimes that helps these horses back off a bit. They, they respect the fences and that actually naturally tends to stop them from running with the choke out. And so uh, I would hope that he'll be two mile four plus, two mile four to three mile chaser, but he is going to have to learn to, to drop the bit. At home, all the time we had him, the relatively short time we had him, yes, a little bit keen, but absolutely straightforward, no hanging, no difficulties. I'd have been very disappointed if he hadn't won in that race up at Kelso, fortunately he did. Um, and he's, well, he's only six, 
I think he's a great buy and I think we've got an exciting one to look forward to again. And again, my plan is to go novice chasing with him. Great. So again, it, he'll come in sort of what, in the, in, in the yeah. autumn? Yeah, coming in July. Coming in the beginning of July. Uh, that's enough break for these horses. He'll have had um, sort of two and a half months, which is, it is more than enough. And then, um, um, and then we'll get him started in July to have him on track October, November. That, that would be the time, the timings. We've got to just, I suppose, one very slight caution would be, I feel sure those will be the timings, but we've got to see what the programme book does with this, all this uh, corona stuff going on. They're still jigging around with it. And obviously, uh, the ones that are starting off now, beginning of July, we're likely to carry on, carry on with them much longer than we would otherwise to get a proper season into them. But in principle, uh, the thinking is that we'll be starting the, we'd like to start the work. I like to start the winter horses off by the middle of July latest, normally. Yeah. Great. Well, we're getting lots and lots of questions in for you, Richard, particularly about buying horses. And just before we come on to those, what I'd like to ask you about is, uh, is Arba Vitae, who obviously we, we very recently purchased uh, a new horse yet to run for us. But can you give us a little bit of background, uh, you know, about our new horse? Absolutely. Uh, well, another very exciting acquisition. Um, Six-year-old mare. Um, people will know years ago, I never used to train mares, but actually I'm keener and keener on it now because I do think there's good opportunities for them. Um, she's by Arcadio, who's a stallion that's gathering momentum, really. Um, funny enough, just um, just had a horse, I've been at a text saying it's been vetted today, another Arcadio I'm buying. So, um, uh, tra trained by Dot Love in Ireland, who would... would she gets winners occasionally, but I wouldn't say she sets the world alight over in Ireland. So we'd be hopeful we can get some improvement. But she showed definite ability in Ireland. You know, she's been twice been second, um, sorry, uh, second and third, uh, twice placed in novice hurdles in Ireland. I thought it's quite interesting. She's running over two and a quarter miles and two and a half miles on heavy. And she's another one that's been a bit keen in her races. And they've let her sort of front run and run in the, from the front long way. And she ran remarkably well in the two and a half mile race and heavy to get as far as she did, um, really. And um, she's very well bred. Again, full sister to I'm a Game Changer, who's run to marks of nearly 150. Well, that's top echelons. Uh, Philip Hobbs trained that horse um, and what he went on to, I think it's Gordon Elliott's now. And there's another, another half brother that's been rated 146 RPL. That's very high. So this is a good family, very well bred horse coming from a fairly small yard in Ireland um, that is still a maiden, which is ideal for our purposes because it means that, you know, she, it makes it slightly easier to place them and, um, and, and, and get wins and so on. Um, and I think, and that looking closely at the, Half, the, sorry, the full brother, I'm a game changer. He wanted good grab, two miles, two mile four. And I, particularly the way the exuberance that she's running, and she's quite light framed, I would be very surprised if good ground didn't help her. And she's not had the chance to be running it yet. So if you put all those things together, like it's a bit of a crossword puzzle, these buying horses, a, a few ifs and buts, and you, 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 you know, and one or two assumptions made, some of which may prove right and some of which may prove wrong. But I think that. Um, she looks a great value buy and uh, I'll be extremely disappointed if we can't win. And, but because of the good ground component, I would like to get her out this summer. So my plan with her would be, um, with everyone's agreement, would be to um, get her. She's one of the horses I'm looking to restart on May the 11th. She's in the field and actually I got a bulletin on her just um, today prior to this. And that, in the, the, everyone's very happy that in the field. She's in my field of mares and fillies. And, um, but she's put a bit of condition on, which is what I wanted to hear. So he says she looks better for it. So even this short break will be helpful and gives us something to train for the summer. So in a perverse way, it might have worked out quite well for her that we've been forced to give her a little holiday and then we can hopefully get cracking in the summer going into the autumn. Thank you. So one of the questions a lot of people have asked is horse prices seem to have been going up and up and over, over recent years. Has the current situation created a, a buying opportunity, perhaps for the, the bargain hunters and those that are willing to, to get involved now, or actually have prices been largely unaffected? Um, I don't mind being called a bargain hunter if it's me. Uh, I, I absolutely, uh, I think clearly pricing is a crucial thing, how much you're prepared to pay for 
horses in the sport, particularly when we think prize money is probably going to be going backwards now. I think I think definitely will be going backwards because of the um, lack of bookmaker contribution with the bookmakers shut and so on and so forth. And, and there's some of them closing down because of the fruit machine thing as well. So prize money, jump rate prize, prize money is likely to take a bit of a hit. It's got to be relevant what you're paying for. In terms of what's going on at the moment, quite interesting. I've been very busy. I bought three new horses this week and last week, and I'm trying to build up, um, build, building up a new team going forwards. But at the same token, very fussy about what we buy. I mean, they've got to tick the right boxes. But what I'm finding is that all the people, particularly in Ireland, they would normally be sending all these horses over for the Doncaster end of May sale. It's not going to happen. Uh, Cheltenham sales have all been stopped. There is no sale for them to sell these horses. And they're thinking, well, heck, how do we move these people, move, move these horses on? So more of them are coming to the private market. And I, I literally probably pretty much every day I've got an agent, two or three agents who I would deal with and pretty much every day they're putting something forward. Now I still could be, and, and I'll give you an example. I bought, I've just bought a horse that um, was offered to me a month ago for 50,000 sterling. And uh, if, if I tell you, I bought it for under half that price a month later, it's come back to me. I mean, I wouldn't have paid the 50 sterling, but suddenly a horse that's running a point to point that was bought as a store for over 50,000 euros, great big scopey horse and come second on debut. Those horses were going, as we know, for a lot, lot more money than that. 60, they'd have been hoping for 80,000 probably. Uh, at the sales, but they've taken a view that they, a lot of them need for their cash flow. They've got to move the horses on. So I think the short answer is there are opportunities. Um, in terms of pricing, definitely there's some some slack in the pricing because of this. Um, I, I suspect it won't last very long as soon as the sales start carrying on. But it remains to be seen what will happen at the auction houses in the future because there are must be a lot of people whose businesses have been affected who who. Um, uh, who may no longer be players in this market. But having said that, we've said these things before and we haven't always seen it. As you say, prices have tended to go up and up. But I, I sort of have an idea about what I think um, is the right amount of money to pay for a horse. Um, I mean, when I say that, I'm very happy to buy cheaper ones, but I'm not particularly a fan. I mean, many people know that we've been training for 14 years, but I've never paid 100,000 for a horse. And yet we're competing with people. I've only paid over 50,000, probably five times, six times, maybe in 14 years. And um, to be honest, I wouldn't say they've been particularly great investments. The, the ones we pay more for either we've done better with the ones often that have been cheaper. So, um, but of course we're competing against yards that are regularly paying this kind of money all the time for horses. So, but I can't personally bring myself to want to pay that kind of money for a horse. And I wouldn't expect, and there aren't many other people with my experience who really want to pay that amount of money for a horse. So you've got to be sensible in terms of trying to pay the right money for the right type of horse. And you hope you're buying a horse with potential and so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, a lot of your success has been achieved with very, dare I say cheap, but, but it, you know, in the context of the industry, I think you could say cheap horses. And it certainly sounds to me like that's a strategy that you know you don't intend to change. I, absolutely, um, I, I don't intend to change it. I mean, when you see people paying these fancy prices, I, I don't really know what's going through their mind. When people are paying four hundred thousand pounds for a gelding, um, you can't breed from it. Um, they've got to win two Cheltenham Gold Cups to get your money back. Uh, I, I mean, it strikes me that. The double, if you pay double the price, um, we know a lot of these horses can get injuries. And if, if you do, it's just double the disappointment. And uh, it's certainly no guarantees paying a lot of money that you're going to be on the big stage. And I mean, my philosophy, Dan, is that, yes, we've increased the numbers, but it's not to change the approach. You know, I, I think we want, what I want, first of all, is lots of winners. We want to keep, we want to buy horses we think we can win races for. And if I can't, if we can't think we can win a race, there's no point us training that horse. Um, you know, we, we, I'd rather move that horse on and find something else. And, and that would be the correct advice for any owner as well. You, there's no point putting good money after bad if they're not up to it. Um, but my view is that if we, are, of course, we would all love to win the big races. And of course, I'd love to win more Cheltenham races or go win another Grand National, which I 
definitely would love to do. Um, if Jamie does sort of want to move that horse for a transfer, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm sure I can find him something to replace it. You're, but, talk, you're um, talking about Hogan's Heights. Yes, yes. Next year's yeah. Grand National winner. Yeah, well, I must say, if any, any owners of Hogan's Heights are on, uh, are on this call, um, desperately bad luck. I'm, I'm so sorry for you didn't get your run. And the fact you weren't even allowed in the virtual Grand National is just ridiculous. Um, but you know, my, my philosophy is that um, I've seen other trainers over the years try and change their methodology to try and force big winners and, it, and they've come unstuck. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, don't, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but Tim Vaughan was doing very well getting quite a lot of winners and he suddenly decided he wanted more Saturday winners and Saturday winners. And so we went out and bought a lot of stores and then he's barely training any winners at all. I mean, that's not quite true. But then obviously, he's come back. And he's a good trainer. But my point is, you can't just magic it up. Um, yes, you can, you know, if, if an owner comes along and wants to spend a lot of money, then it gives you a better chance of buying a proven good horse. But other than that, if, if, you're, if you're working through what I would call a normal man or a sensible budget, then my hope is, and it's happened in the past, is if we keep doing the right things with the right horses, some of them may just surprise us and take us to the next stage. Ronnie, if you'd said to me at the beginning, was gonna to get to where he's got to, and he's won over 180,000 pounds, I would have said, don't be ridiculous. But we've had plenty of others like that. You know, Burn Tote Boy winning the Coral Cup. I, I, it was a, that was a long time ago now, but a complete surprise. Pinot de Ray was bought as a hopeful to get a Grand National one, and you couldn't really say you're gonna go and win it. Um, you know, so, I think our best chance is to keep doing what we're doing, do it well, do it the best we can, and hopefully some of them, maybe Mr Muldoon, maybe little Rory Mack, might just surprise us and take us to a different level. You never know. Very interesting. We live so in a, hope. Repeated, a repeated question we've had, Richard, is this horse you bought from Ireland at half the, the £50,000, can he be a foxtrot horse? Yeah. Well, he can. He's, he's not got an owner at the moment. Whether he's the right one for you, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, we've got two or three uh, new ones, but they, funny enough, they've all come. They've all come from the point to point field, and you say, "Well, in future, well, Richard, you never used to buy them from the point to point field, and they didn't." But mainly, that was because they were too expensive. But if they're going to, if the price is going to start coming to a real realistic level, then what you're getting is a very nice young horse. But, but he's he's a big horse, would so take a bit of time. But it'd be for next winter. He's called Bally Body. If anyone wants to look him up, that one, Bally Body, as in sorry. Like as in barley body, B A L I, new word body, B O D Y. Yeah, the Magnias own him, even though it's not in their name anymore. But they, they, the Magnias owned him, and they paid fifty-five thousand from as a store. And he was obviously too big to be a bumper horse, so he left Joseph O'Brien, and he's and he's just touched off on a point to point. P possibly should have won it. I think he missed the last, and uh, two lengths clear and, and finished second. So he's a, he looks a nice buy. Well, heard it, heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let me ask you a question moving away from the sales and one again that a lot of our members have been asking and I have to understand which we've got nearly 95 people involved in this and I'm, I'm getting lots and lots of questions so I'm looking to see which of the questions that are most popular and trying to sort of bring them together into, into one question to ask you and things that people are asking are why do horses improve when they arrive at Richard Newland's yard? Well, first of all, of course, they don't all improve. Um, but obviously, we, we're always buy, we, we buy a lot of horses in training. You know, we buy horses that I like, you know, people know. I've probably only trained, I think, one store in my entire life, which incidentally was the first ever Foxtrot horse because you laid at least to Paddy the Hare. And uh, I took a bit of convincing then. It was, it was offered to me as a store. I'll just I digress a bit, but he, he, he was offered me as a store for, for not very much money. And um, I trained the full brother. And the full brother was a good horse, which is why they tracked me down and said, well, do you want him? And I was convinced they must have tried this horse and they must be useless. And in the end, uh, I agreed to take, do the deal because it wasn't very much money. And of course he turned out to be an absolute star. It was very unfortunate he got injured when he did. And an old favorite, 2012, he made his debut for Foxtrot. I looked him up, Paddy the Hare. But I think, um, uh, so if I don't train stores, so I'm therefore, I am training horses that have done a bit somewhere. 
Now, some of them might be like these new ones, just young horses that are just to, to start off with and we'll, it, you know, they're unexposed and see what happens. But very often the value is buying horses that maybe have lost their way a bit, but have shown above average ability at, at, average, at some point. And you've got a chance of bringing those horses back. But obviously the key thing is to try and work out which ones may come back or may improve. Big factor for us um, is where we get these horses from. So for example, if, if there's a nice horse, I mean, well, let's take Arbor Vita. If Arbor Vita was not trained by Dot Love, but being trained by Willie Mullins, I would not have been putting my hand up to buy her. Because you just don't improve many horses coming out of Willie Mullins' yard. But I know that coming out of Dot Love's yard, there's a, at least I'm happy that we've got, she shouldn't go backwards. And hopefully there's a good chance she'll go forwards. So a lot of it is about trying, is, is about where they're coming from and trying to understand the program they've had. And then I think it comes down to what are the key components to our training routine? Well, it's fitness and well-being. Well-being being a big part of it. Well-being being that turnout, being six, eight hours a day, getting rid of gastric ulcers if they've got them. And fitness is they do have to do their work. They do, we, we do, we probably work them harder than quite a few other trainers do. And, you know, that's, so this is the thing about, people will know we we do short sharp lots but we make them get their heart rate up it's not a we don't put them in so much cotton wool that they're never breaking sweat you have to you have to work hard but if you work hard we'll look after you well and you get lots of nice play time so it's that combination uh, and then of course ultimately when you're buying a horse you want to be buying a horse i immediately want to be buying a horse thinking which races i'm going to run it in it, your head's already ahead so so the, Arbor Vita, again, I'd have been less keen on her if she'd won a, a, a race. That might sound funny to people. She's not proven she can win. But of course, by being a maiden, it means we've got the whole of next year as a novice hurdler. We weren't going to lose that season. We'd be over now. We'd have to go handicap hurdling if, if we hadn't got it. So it's important you buy a horse that can fit the races where they've got maximum chance of winning as well. Within Foxtrot, we've obviously got a, a number of different trainers that have very different uh, attitudes, perhaps, towards buying horses. Some yeah. trainers, we would buy a horse and send it to them. But I definitely get the impression with you, Richard, that, that you'd want to be very much involved in the buying of the horses and the selecting the horses that you're going to train. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely would. Uh, I, I'm, I prefer that. Um, don't get me wrong. I, if someone offers me a, 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 a do sometimes, you know, say, would I take on the training of a horse? I'm not going to say no if it's, you know, we'll have a go with them. But I do think to get, our, I think our best success has been effective buying of horses and then doing well with them. So, I mean, even in my first year when we had four horses, I bought two horses that in that year. Um, Overstrand was the first horse I bought as a trainer, I paid 10,000 for him. And Burnt Oak Boy, I paid 10,000 for him uh, a month later. Uh, and they both won over 100,000 in the first season. Uh, now, it doesn't always work like that. We know that we've all had our disappointments and you're going to get your disappointments. But um, I think it's, let's put it this way. I, I, I suppose I, we spend an awful, I spend an awful lot of time doing it, looking at it, watching all the videos, horses and, and you know, so um, it would be, um, I'd, I'd like to be involved if possible. But, it, but I'm not going to put, stick my nose, you know, I'm, I'm not going to turn my nose up if someone offers me a nice horse. We've got a got a Grand National horse for you for next year. You might just accept it. <laughs> I, I, I'll find a box. And I'll build a box now. <laughs> right. So we've talked about the yard. We've talked about the horses. Um, we've had a few questions about owners in your yard. Um, but you, you've got a lot of sole owners, a lot of small partnerships. Um, what is your real view? And obviously just between you and me here, what's your real view about syndicates? Um, I, I think it's all great fun. Uh, look, I, what I've witnessed, I mean, I, I'm hoping you might, you might give, this, give me the stats down, but, you know, we, we've now had a, trained a lot of horses for Foxtrot. Foxtrot, you, you are the biggest owner in our yard. Uh, so, without question. So, I, first thing I should just say to everyone else is thank you very much, because, uh, you know, we do need horses to train and someone to pay the bills. So, thank you very much for entrusting us with the opportunity to train these horses. Um, what was the question again? Yes, stats. I wanted to say. I wanted to say to you that um, the um, uh, you know how many. I wonder how many winners we've had together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in that in that time since 2012. You've. I've got to be honest. You put me on the spot there. I'm not sure I can tell you. It's um, 
what what would be particularly interesting i think the number of winners but the return based on the amount of money spent on those horses you know you look at horses like Cade Lynn, who you know won the the most valuable two mile handicap chase in britain ronnie uh, well we could keep the list going you know th these horses were cheap buys and yet as you said before have gone on progressed and i think done you know fantastically won and K. De Lynn owners won't mind me saying, I mean, they've not chipped into their pot for, for literally years since they bought the horse. And I think that is, you know, obviously that, that's an exception to the rule. But what I think is, it's not just about the strike rate, but also about the strike rate with horses that you have selected and bought you know, for, for what's not been a huge amount of money. And um, so I, I don't know the answer to your, your question, which is about how many runners we were, or how many winners we've had, but I'd love to have a look. But also I'd love to look at the strike rate of that because, um, you know, I think it's not just about having winners, it's about having winners regularly. And, you know, what the return would be in terms of the, the, the fairly small amount of money that we're spending in, in the context of the industry. So I'll go away, I'll do some research and we'll come up with some stats. Let me just answer, I, I forgot, didn't answer the question probably about syndicates. Um, I think people, I'm sure when they hear me talk, they realise the passion I have for the whole sport. And I think, and most people know that I went into this really as a hobby because I was a passionate racing nut. And what I love is, and I see the joy with the syndicates, is when we share it together when they're coming for, when everyone's coming for open days at the yard or at the track or whatever, what have you. We've had a lot of fun together. It's, it's tremendous. And I love seeing the excitement because it's the same excitement that I feel. And, and, and I still feel it today as much as ever, every time we have a winner. And I think that um, in terms of, Syndicates, single owners. Do you know? Um, and I, you, it's going to sound inappropriate saying it, but everyone here would know. Dan, you run an incredibly well-organised syndicate. It's a pleasure to work with you and with the whole Foxtrot team. It's so well organised, and that makes my life a lot easier. And we obviously have a good relationship, which is great. I, I think, but I, you've got to be realistic. Racing is a very expensive game. And, you know, most people um, can't afford to own whole horses and pay for all the training fees on their own. And of course, many of, them, many of them may not want to. And they enjoy the social side like this, putting on things like this. So, um, look, I am absolutely enjoy it as much as everyone else does uh, who's, who's watching this. And um, it's a great thrill and um, an absolute pleasure. Well, I think we've got time for one more question, Richard. And... Uh, I think this is a very suitable question. So let's finish with, with this one. So one of our members has asked, what's your proudest achievement so far as a trainer? Um, well, I suppose I've got to say, um, winning the Grand National is the biggest achievement. You know, that, that was a lifetime moment. And um, not, nice to think it could be repeated, which is my, you know, we're hoping you know, in the days we've got left on this planet that we can achieve that. But um, you need, need a, bit of, a bit of luck and a fair win to do it, probably. Um, but that said, it, it's it more than that. I think, you know, when I started, um, I was very inexperienced. We're doing it with four horses as a permit. I suppose I'm very proud that we've made ourselves into a successful professional operation that's respected and that can compete at the highest, you know, compete with the top trainers. Um, we may not have quite the firepower that some of them have, but we're, we're respected by them. And that if we do have the firepower that we're, we're, we're considered a serious training yard. You know, I take a great pride in that. And it's not, it's not just me, it's, it's very much not just me, it's the team. I've got a brilliant assistant trainer, Rod, who's a personal friend, and most of you will know Rod. Um, I've got a very good yard manager who's joined the team. And in fact, the move this year, we've scaled up the staffing. We've got really good work riders, you know, it's a, it's a good grooms and so on. So it's, it's a team effort um, that can take you there. But I'm proud that I've been part of setting that up and, and making that happen. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. You've given us a huge amount of fun with our horses and no doubt we'll continue to do so. And thank you for your time today. It really is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone at Foxtrot. Look forward to seeing you on the races soon, I hope. Great. Well, thank you again, Richard. And for those of you that didn't know where I am, I hope you haven't been fooled that I'm at the Mongol Derby, where uh, you may remember, 1st of April, we came up with a, a genius idea to send some of our horses here. So uh, 
well done for those of you that recognise the Mongol Derby. Uh, so at five o'clock this afternoon, we got Paige Fuller and she will be the last, uh, that'll be the last webinar for this week. So really looking forward to speaking to Paige at five o'clock. Uh, but thank you all very much for joining us. This has been our most popular webinar of the week. So it's been a pleasure to speak to Richard and thank you all very much indeed for, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you at five o'clock. <laughs>